This is, this is one of the, I didn't know this guy till today, and I had a hundred people tell me to hire you, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pray about that. But Steph, uh, it's nice to have Steph help with that worship team. Micah McDonald, won't you come? He travels around. He's been speaking in Minnesota camps. Give him a big welcome, will you? God bless you. Okay. All right. All right. Yes. Thanks, guys. Well, I'm alive. We knocked I made it, I'm alive. Good morning, church. It's great to be a Hawkeye fan today. It's a great day to be a Hawkeye fan, everyone. My, was that too soon for some of the Cyclone fans in here? Was that a little, a little too soon? My wife and I, uh, we were at camp and we were really craving some coffee yesterday. Uh, some Starbucks or Caribou, so I typed it in my Google Maps. We were over in Dayton, Iowa, and the closest coffee shop was Ames, Iowa. Well, I don't visit Iowa much because I'm from Minnesota. I'm from the Minneapolis area. I'm a lead youth pastor there, and uh, my wife, Steph, who is singing, we have a one-year-old daughter, uh, Everly, just an amazing, beautiful girl, but anyway, uh, I went to Ames, Iowa, and I'm, I'm driving through. Did I say that right? I'm hearing some heckling from the, from the peanut gallery. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm driving through, and I see all of these Cyclone fans just with their heads bound down, walking the street. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, they must be going to a game. And my wife's like, yeah, there must be a game later this afternoon. And uh, when, when I pulled over into a grocery store over at the High V there, I uh, pulled up Iowa State, and sure enough, Hawkeyes 44, Iowa State 41. No wonder the Cyclone fans were disappointed. But today is NFL kickoff Sunday, and that means that means that means chili in the crock pots. It means pumpkin spice lattes, and it means the Vikings are starting their road trip to the Super Bowl in Minneapolis in 2018. Everybody, that's what that means right there. Yep, that's what that means. And for, some of the, and for some of the people in the audience, I just lost all credibility from here on out. Because you're thinking to yourself, here's another delusional Minnesota fan. There he is. Look at him up there. He's going to make a fool of himself. I'm sure of it. No, but guys, this past weekend was amazing. Uh, we got to be with the middle schoolers, and you guys rock. The middle schoolers of New Hope Youth, you guys are amazing. And uh, Friday night, we... Um, had a session from Genesis 3 where Adam and Eve were hiding in the garden because they know they had done wrong and we led them through a series where James 5 says, that, hey, look, if anyone needs prayer, like confess one to another and pray for one another so that you might be healed and kids circled up Friday night just being open, being vulnerable because if there's any place where you should be able to be real with your mess, if there's any place where you can come as you are, if there's any place where you can just dump things off and load things off and what's going on, it should always be the church it should always be the church the bars will be filled with people dumping messes but the number one place where a person should go where they feel like they wouldn't be judged where they wouldn't be frowned upon for what they wear should be the church and it was powerful because the church happened Friday night as students just opened up to each other and said hey here's what's going on in my life and then Saturday morning was amazing Saturday morning I brought 120 missionary friends from this church that you guys support on the monthly basis here and we laid 120 missionary names and families on the stage and Saturday morning kids came forward to the altar to grab a missionary family to say I'm not going to forget about this family but every month I'm going to pray for this family every month I'm going to try to write a letter to this family to stay in contact because the reality is the missionaries that we send on the field they won't tell you this when they get five minutes for a missions window here but I'll be a voice for them and I'll let you know missionaries feel the weight and the call of God of being a missionary, and it's lonely. It's a lonely job. In the first couple months when missionaries first go out, they're getting emails and they're getting letters from family, but ask them when they're getting letters two years, three years down the road. It's as if people forget about them, and a younger generation, middle school students, are gonna be the ones that remember our missionary families, that pray for them, that support them, that write them letters, and it was powerful to see. And then last night, we saw students get baptized in the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter two, when Pentecost happened, the Holy Spirit showed up 
up and people were baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'll just tell you this, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was not just meant for Pentecost Sunday. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is meant for every day because the, the Holy Spirit and the person of the Spirit is a baptizer. It's who he is and students were baptized in the Spirit. And then last night we spoke from Genesis chapter 22 where Abraham is asked to lay down what was most important to him at his time. It was his son, the inheritance, the son Isaac, the only son he had that God provided. And he lays Isaac down at an altar to give him up before God and God shows up and provides. And last night the challenge to students was to go all in. Because here's the deal, there is an urgency that the spirit is stirring within believers. There is an urgency and the time is now. And our nation, America, this state, Iowa and this city, Urbandale, desperately needs an awakening from God. We need revival in this land. We need an awakening from the Holy Spirit. And the Bible is clear. It says, if my people who are called by my name, not talking about the people that aren't in church right now, not talking about the people that could give a rip about Jesus, the Bible says, if my people, believers in Jesus, who are called by my name, will humble themselves pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will come and heal their land. God is wanting to heal our land. God is stirring up believers all over the world for such a time as this. God has anointed you to not wait on your pastor to bring the good news. God has anointed you to be the pastor in your community. God has anointed you to be the pastor in your family. God has anointed you and put his spirit upon you to be a light in this world for such a time as this. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. Your pastors. Your pastors were never meant to shoulder the load. But Ephesians 4.12 says the pastors were called to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. That tells me this, that every person that's sitting in a pew that doesn't have credentials, that never went to school for ministry, the Holy Spirit just gave you credentials and said you are equipped for ministry. I've given you my spirit to step out and be a servant for me. God does the equipping. And in this room today, there are stories, tons of stories. There are different circumstances, there's different things that you've faced. There's, 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 there's some people right now where you've walked in and you're on welfare and you don't know how you're gonna make the next rent payment. And for some of you, there's people in here where you're at the highest chain of command in your position. You are an owner of a business. You're a CEO of a company. And in this room, we have all sorts of varieties of stories, circumstance, and outcomes. But the one thing that is true is that God is good. God is good. And it does not matter the circumstance, it doesn't matter where you currently are in your life, it doesn't change the fact that God is good. And what's powerful is I could give you the microphone this morning and say, share with me what happened when Christ found you. Because every single one of us in here who've been found by Christ has a story of transformation. Because when you encounter Jesus, you can't help but be undone. When you encounter Jesus, you can't help but say, you know what? I just found the greatest thing. Nothing else matters. It is Jesus and him alone. Nothing else compares to him. That is how you know if you know Jesus. Because there is a transformation. There is a change. I like to say it this way. Good luck trying to stay the same person that you once were when you encounter Jesus and meet Jesus. Good luck, because when you meet him and you experience him and you know him, you cannot help but be changed. So many stories in the Bible filled where Jesus encounters man, and man had a choice, and the men who surrendered their lives, the men who humbled themselves, were the men who experienced transformation, were the men who went home filled with joy, filled knowing the truth that the Savior was actually real. You see, for me, up here, dressed up real nice, being a speaker who travels and preaches, who could maybe do it anywhere else. There's no difference between me and you. I breathe the same air. I wake up in the morning just like you wake up. I have faced my own battles. I have faced my own trials and my struggles just like you have. Growing up as a young boy, I remember the person I wanted to be like, the hero that, that I really wanted to become was my dad. And I watched my dad's life and the way he was and how he treated my mom. And I'm the oldest of three sisters, by the way, I'm the only boy in the house. And every time my mom was pregnant, I was like, please let it be a boy for crying out loud, okay? Because I wanted a brother so bad. And well, God didn't give me a brother. I grew up with all sisters. So I grew up listening to conversations like, um, 
that's my scarf, and you didn't ask to borrow it, okay? <laughs> like, I grew up listening to that all the time, and of course, I couldn't wrestle them to the ground or put them in headlocks or chokes because, well, you just don't do that to your sisters, right? My dad made that clear, but growing up, like, my dad was my, was my hero. I, that's who I wanted to be like, and he owned his own pest control business. He was a local firefighter. Everyone in the community knew him, and my dad actually ended up becoming a youth pastor at a church plant, and I just remember the thing that I valued most, more than anything about my dad, is he had a passion for Jesus. He had a zeal for God, and I watched how he led me and my sisters, and I was like, and how he treated my mom, I was like, that's who I want to be like. And it wasn't some days after where I saw my dad's life begin to change. I saw, it's not like one day you just wake up and say, well, I'm going to forget God, and I want to live my life how I want to live. No, we end up where we end up because of small little choices in the daily. We, we are a result of our choices today that in, end up impacting our tomorrow, and I remember watching my dad just do little things that were different. And my bedroom was just across the hallway from my mom and dad's. And I remember there would be multiple nights where a shift would happen where I would wake up in the middle of the night hearing my mom crying herself to sleep. And I would walk across the hall. I was 12 years old at the time. I would open up the door and I'd go in her bedroom. And there her face was in the pillow trying to cover her cries so that my three younger sisters who were in the other room next door and me wouldn't wake up from it. But almost every night I would wake up and I would open up the door and I'd look inside a room and I'd look to the left and I realized that my dad was gone. And what I found out at a young age is multiple nights my dad was exchanging his faith for a lifestyle that he wanted to live. And he'd go out to the bars late at night, come, out, come back after the bars would close and he'd stumble in our house and I'd hear him come in about three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes there'd be arguments that take place between my mom and dad and and then I remember seeing my dad do things I never should have seen. Instead of going into his room and watching him read the word, I remember going into his room and my dad would be rolling drugs or be assembling different drugs and he'd quick try to hide it from me. I was at an age where I was old enough to see it. And then seeing my dad cheat on my mom with multiple women, hearing things, witnessing and seeing things I never should have seen. And as a young man, that impacts me because, and for some of you, you know what this experience is like because you've watched it play out maybe even in your own life right now or you've watched it play up when you were younger growing up and watching your mom and dad and see this father of mine was the one who introduced me to God and now I'm a young man sitting here being like is this really God is God good and I'm sure you can anticipate what happens next but after 17 years of marriage he sits me and my three sisters down and says I'm leaving your mom I'm divorcing her and good luck kids I'm leaving and I'm not gonna step foot in church ever again I'm not gonna be the man you want me to be I'm done and I'm out I was embracing that for the last two years of my life and my sisters it just hit them like a ton of bricks and now all of a sudden I was forced into being the role of playing the man of the house and there's a lie out there that says divorce doesn't impact kids and divorce is fine and whatever and the reality is it does impact kids. It does impact people. And not even a year after that, my youngest sister, Victoria, who was eight years old, my mom was tucking her in bed one night and scratching her back just like moms do. And I love back scratches from moms, by the way. It's just the best. Anybody with me, mom back scratches? They're just great. So nice. You're just scratching my back. Some of you are 30 years old in the audience and you still go to your mom's house just for a back scratch. I know it. I, I, it's because it's me, okay? It's me. But anyway, uh, and she's tucking her in and she comes across a big lump in her leg and my mom says, you know, Victoria, what's this? And she goes, it's just a bruise, mom, don't worry about it. As my mom's tucking her in, she's like, no, this isn't right. She brings her to the doctor. They did a biopsy on it and they found out there was a six inch by eight inch tumor wrapped around her femur bone in the middle of all four of her quadriceps. And when they did the biopsy, they found out she had stage four synovial cell sarcoma cancer. She's eight years old, my dad just walked out of my family and now my younger sister was just given 20% chance to live. Is God still good then? Because I think sometimes when we go through things, we start to have questions that don't always have cookie cutter answers. And I just wanna say something. This place is a safe place to process your questions that are really difficult to answer with God. You wanna know why? Because God's big enough to answer the que God's big enough to handle the questions that maybe you can't seem to answer. And instead of us just saying, oh, it's fine, it will work out. No, it's okay to, to be real in this place. It's okay to process your questions. This is a safe place to ask really difficult questions and hard questions. Welcome to the club. But me being now 14 and wondering, God, who are you? 
She went, battled it for two years, went through all the chemotherapy, all the radiation her little body could handle. The tumor spread to her lungs. She went through over 15 surgeries. She had all the scars to prove it. And then Make-A-Wish Foundation shows up. And by the way, when Make-A-Wish shows up, it usually means it's because the person's going to die. And my younger sister's wish was to go to Florida, swim with the dolphins, and go to Walt Disney World. So here I am with my family, my three sisters, who has a 20% chance to live, my mom and dad bickering in the car, already divorced and separated. And it's like, can't you just stop doing that? My sister's trying to enjoy her life for the last moments. And for some of you, you can resonate what I'm talking about. You can resonate the things that I'm explaining because this is maybe currently your situation or currently your life, where it seems hopeless and it seems like there's no way out. Well, I remember there was an evangelist that came to our church one day who heard about my sister. Our church had been praying for two years for my sister's healing, that God would show up and do the miraculous. And an evangelist pulled our family into a back room and he said, young lady, one day you're going to testify about how God healed your little body and you're going to come to my church and you're going to tell about it. A couple weeks later after we prayed, just like we had done before and many times before, we went to the doctor to see where all the tumors had gone through her body. And the doctors could not find any cancer or any tumors whatsoever in her body. And the doctors, had, the doctors had put her in remission, and she's been in remission ever since. And not one cell or not one sign of cancer has come back. And this girl who was supposed to die, who was supposed to be in a body cast for the morning, majority of her life, is getting married the 17th of September, is completely fine, and walks just normal. You never know. She has no quadriceps meaning. This is the power of our God. A few, a few years later, my, my dad ended up passing away in a tragic motorcycle accident. And my goodbye was literally in a hospital bed with him sitting right there. And what was really cool is something I never told anybody was, I always wanted to preach with my dad one day. Because my dad was a, a preacher before he kind of fell away from God. I wanted to preach with him one day. That was always a dream of mine. And little did I know, a month before my dad passed away, my cousin had committed suicide. And the father of my cousin called my dad and said, Chuck, I want you to do the funeral. And I want you to preach it. And he's like, okay. You see, my dad ended up coming back around to the Lord towards the end of his life. And I remember my dad on the drive up said, son, I'm going to start the message. You're going to finish it. You're going to close it. And little did I know that would be the only time and the last time I ever got to preach with my dad. And I want to say something, because you need to hear this. What my dad did caused a lot of pain and caused a lot of hurt to us children. But I honor my dad. I honor my dad. And there is power, there is supernatural power when you honor. Because we can choose to either live embittered and holding on to other people's sin that they did to us. Or we can choose to live a life that's open-handed and choose to forgive how God has so graciously forgiven us time and time again. My dad, my dad was not a perfect man. My dad had his issues. My dad had things that he went through, but I honor my dad. I'm thankful that I got to have him in my life for the time that I did. You see, life is short. And in this life, There are so many different things we can live for, give our time to, give our money to, give our resources, and you name it. We can give our life to everything. And it is possible to spend an entire lifetime and completely miss it. It is possible to spend hours and hours of labor and working and dealing with kids, and this kid got sick, and going through the motions and going through life, or maybe trying to achieve something, but completely miss it. You know, there's people in here, like maybe like you and I, where we know Jesus, but maybe you don't actually know Jesus. You see, I know Michael Jordan. I know he's one of the greatest basketball players to ever play. But if you were to say, do you actually really know Michael Jordan? No, I don't actually know Michael Jordan because I've never hung out with him. I've never spent time with him. I've never had him over to my my house. I've never actually played basketball with him. I've never done anything. So no, I actually don't know Michael. I know about him. And I think one of the dangers in the, in the faith and following Jesus is we know about Jesus as the healer. We know about Jesus as the one, the miracle worker who fed the 5,000. We even know that, yeah, he was that guy who died for the sins of the world. But it is possible to know about Jesus, but to completely miss it and not actually know Jesus. To not actually experience him. And what God wants for us, and this is point number one, God wants us to know Christ. He wants us to know him. 
And if you brought your Bibles, you can open it up to Philippians chapter three. This is where we're gonna be this morning. But Jesus' desire is to know us. It was why we were made. It was why we were created. For us to be in relationship with him, it's the very purpose. If you've been looking for a why to your life, you have literally just discovered your purpose. You've literally discovered the reason why you have air in your lungs is because God made you to be in relationship with you. Now, there was this man who thought he had it all together. There was this man who thought he knew what he was doing. But we soon to find out that he is really missing the mark. Matthew, before we get into Philippians 3, Matthew 13, verse 44 says this, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. Then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything he had and bought it. This is to emphasize my point in saying this, when you know Jesus, And when you found him, nothing else matters. Jesus is speaking in a parable saying, look, when you really encounter me and really, when you really know me as savior, and when you really actually surrender your life and give up everything because you found it, you will know. You will know. And a few verse, a few chapters later in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says this in verse 24, I believe is where it starts. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. He's paralleling just the parable he just said. Look, if you want to find your life, then you're going to lose it. If you want to find your soul and find your life, then you're going to lose it because nothing else is going to matter except what you find to be true. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? You see, there was a man who thought he had gained the whole world. There was a man who thought he had attained it all and made it sense of it, and people looked up to him, people idolized him, people wanted to be like him. Young Jewish boys saw Paul, saw the Pharisee, saw the zeal in his eyes, and said, that's someone I want to be like. And in Paul's very own eyes, he thought he was doing God a favor by killing people who professed to believe in Jesus, because it was about the law, it was about adhering to the rules, the 600 some rules that you were supposed to follow, the ceremonial passages, the different things. Paul was the most zealous of them all. In fact, in Acts chapter seven, you see Paul holding coats for the stoning of Stephen, basically saying this, I delight that I am watching Christians be annihilated. And in Acts chapter nine, he gets permission to go to a city, to jail, to wipe out Christians, and to put them away forever. And on this journey and on this road in Acts chapter 9, we see Paul have a conversion on the road where the real thing actually meets him. The real encounter actually shows up and transforms Paul. In an instant, Jesus shows up on the scene. The light blinds him. He falls to the ground and Jesus says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And in one moment, in one encounter with God, Paul's life is radically different. And from verse 1 all the way to about verse 22, we see he gets saved, he encounters Jesus, and then he's all of a sudden preaching in synagogues. And you know what? They left out a bunch of details, didn't they? Luke left out a bunch of details in Acts chapter 9. But in Philippians 3, Paul gives us the rest of the details. In Philippians verse 3, you see... In verse, we'll start in verse four, it says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence, Paul's about to give us the resume. He's about to give us credentials on what he did have. He says, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee as for zeal, persecuting the church as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul's saying, look, according to my own doings, according to my own diligence, my persistent, I was faultless according to the Pharisee sect, according to the greatest tribe you could come from. I had it all. And then in verse seven, he says this. He says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, time out. This word knowing right here, when Paul says, all of it that I just told you, it is all garbage, it is rubbish. Some translations will go as far as menstrual rags or dung, that all of it doesn't even matter. It doesn't compare to knowing Jesus. And this word know, to know Jesus, is gnosis. A Greek word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. And you wanna know what this word means? 
This word does not mean to know about Jesus intellectually. This word means to experience Jesus. Paul's saying, look, everything I thought I was living for, my whole life that I based it on, it doesn't matter because I experienced Jesus and my whole goal is just to experience him more. And when you find Jesus, and when Jesus finds you, your response is that of what Paul's is like, is I just want to know him more. The ability to raise up the ranks within my job, the ability to make more income, the ability to, you name it, you go down the line to work myself out of sin, it compares, it doesn't even compare just to knowing Jesus. Knowing with what Paul is talking about. When Paul is talking about knowing, wanna know what he's talking about? He's talking about salvation here. Knowing is saving. Knowing is salvation. And Paul's saying, look, I found it. I was wrong. I had missed the mark. I thought I was right in my own eyes. But I found out that my righteousness is that of like filthy rags. You see, Christ wants us to know him. And your second point is this, is our righteousness is in Christ. Our righteousness is now in Christ. Look what it says when it goes down a little bit further in Philippians chapter three. He says this, he says, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ, in verse nine, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Worship team, if you could come on up, that would be amazing not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. This is a word for somebody in here right now. This is a word for somebody in here right now. For some of you, you have tried and 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 tried tried to work out your salvation with Jesus. And when you sin or when you enter into sin or you make a mistake, maybe you're in here and you've cheated on your wife. And in turn, you have tried to work and to work and to strive and to strive and to strive and to strive and try and try. And literally, all it feels like is you have a shovel and you just keep digging the pit even deeper and deeper because you feel like you are never good enough. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus took a cross so that the pit that you're in, that you could be out of it once and for all, and that it would never ever again, ever again, have to fall on your own righteousness, but that it would be his son's righteousness, Jesus, who is a perfect, spotless lamb, pure, nothing wrong with him. And so when God looks at you through faith in Jesus, he does not see you, he sees a righteousness that's his son's. He sees his righteousness of Jesus. And how does that happen? Through faith in him. Through faith in him. And here's your third point. It goes perfectly right into it. It's time to forget the past. It's time to forget your past. For some of you, literally, you've been walking and living not in him. By the way, Paul mentions in him, in Christ, about 160 sometimes in the New Testament. Paul's whole thought process is, look, it's all in Jesus. It's all in him. It's him, it's in him. Your righteousness, it's, it's in him, it's not of you. All of that was, it's gone, it's garbage, it doesn't matter, it's in him. And then Paul says this, it's powerful. Verse 12, not that I've already attained all this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me, come on. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Look at me. If there's anybody in here that you feel like you've walked in here with the past and that you're not good enough for Jesus, you need to understand someone. There's someone who wrote over half of the New Testament that probably had a more messed up past than you. His name was Paul. 
Paul decided to kill people. And can you imagine being in jail where he's writing this letter from, probably in Rome. Can you imagine the torment the devil would have tried to go after Paul with? Paul, how dare you get up in front of people and you tell people about a saving grace through faith named Jesus? How can you tell people about that when your past life was full of killing the very people that you're saying they need to find Jesus? Can you imagine the lies? Can you imagine the memories? Can you imagine the blood Paul had on his hands at one point from the people that he executed, that he watched die before his eyes, fathers who didn't have, children who didn't have fathers anymore because of Paul. And can you imagine the past memories that would flare up in his mind in the darkest moments? Why do you think Paul in jail cells would worship God so much? Because it wasn't going to be his past that he remembered, but he was going to press forward and onward into the future that he has in Jesus. And every single person in here, it doesn't matter what you've done, in Jesus there is a future for your life and you are not bound and dictated by your past. You are not bound by what was and what happened, but you are who Jesus says you are. Jesus wants you to know him. When was the last time you actually experienced Jesus? When was the last time you experienced him? For some of us, we like to boast about our spiritual life or our spiritual disciplines. I'll just say this, there is nothing worth boasting about other than Jesus. And our spiritual disciplines in our life are to be something that help us just to say, God, it's for your glory. God, it's about you. Jesus today, his presence is here. He's alive. There's an awakening that God is gonna bring to America. Are we gonna be ready for it, church? Are we gonna be ready for it? To pray and to seek the face of God, just to be with him just to be in his presence. Tonight, I'm gonna to challenge you to get back here tonight. How awesome would it be if this place was packed out just praying and seeking the face of God? What a beautiful opportunity on Sunday nights to linger in his presence, to be with him. I wanna give someone the opportunity today who isn't following Jesus to follow him. Because when you follow him and when you know him, it changes everything. A murderer is the one who wrote over half of the New Testament someone who's been saved by grace through faith. And it's at that moment that you realize that Paul has nothing he can boast about, but the only thing he can really give praise and boast about is that of Jesus and his goodness. God is wanting to pour out his spirit anew. God is wanting to baptize you, to fill you, to set you free, to heal you. That the things that have been once done or the blood that's been on your hands or the abortion that you've walked through that's been haunting you or you name it, has been on your mind. God has something more in store than that. You were not called to be in a jail cell, but called to live free. I'm gonna pray in just a little bit, and then we're gonna sing a song called King of My Heart, and it talks about how good God is. Church, it is possible to literally endure anything and go through anything and still at the end of your day say, God is good. That God is good. And it's the goodness of God that we rehearse in our minds. It's the faithfulness of God. It's the altar moments in our life that we look back and that we remember. The Bible is so often filled with remember. Be reminded, remember. Half of the Christian life is just remembering and how good God is. When I pray, I just want you to pray with me. If you don't know Jesus, I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna include you in my prayer. We're gonna pray together to receive Jesus and to come to know him. And then in just a little bit, I'm gonna ask the church to stand up and I'm gonna ask you to respond this morning. Would you come to the altar? Would you find a moment where you could come before him? There's a big wide open space. Maybe it's at your pew. You turn around and you just get on your knees at your pew. But I think it would be awesome this morning if we could spend some time before the feet of Jesus, just like Mary did, to hear his voice again, to experience him, to know him, to know his voice again and how sweet it is. Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your power. I thank you, God, that literally you invite us to know you <laughs> and that you know every detail, you know every part of our heart, and yet you call us to know you. And then, God, you say, your righteousness that you've attempted to attain, it's as filthy rags, but you have my righteousness now. God, that we get to enter into your righteousness, and God, help us to forget the past and to press onward and forward to the calling that we have in you. God, in these next moments, would you just meet with us? Would you speak to us? God, would we have the heart to hear in Jesus' name? And God, I pray for the person right now who's saying, I want to follow Jesus.
God, we ask for forgiveness of our sins, of our wrongdoings, and we invite your presence now into our life. We invite your saving grace into our hearts to follow you all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.